Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Disaster Hack. I'm glad you've joined us. So today we're going to talk about preparedness. And normally when we hear this concept, our thoughts immediately turn to planning, training, and exercises. These are certainly important aspects of preparedness, but there's something that we need to do before we even get to planning, training, and exercises, and that is to establish a foundation for our emergency management program. So we're going to talk about that today. Let's go. So first of all, one of the things we need to do is understand the goals our nation has for preparedness. FEMA's preparedness goal is to have our nation become a secure and resilient nation with the capabilities required across the whole community to prevent, protect against, mitigate, respond to, and recover from the threats and hazards that pose the greatest risks. So FEMA has developed a preparedness system and it includes several steps. Um, one of the things that we need to do is to identify and assess risk and that is something we often associate with mitigation. We also need to figure out what our capability requirements are and we need to build and sustain those capabilities. Then we need to deliver those capabilities and validate them to ensure that we're making progress and review and update as needed. And so it's really a never ending cycle, this overall preparedness system. And that brings up the preparedness cycle. So the preparedness cycle includes planning, organizing and equipping, training, conducting exercises, evaluating, and then improving. We'll get to some of these later on in a different section, but for now, let's focus more on the foundations of emergency management. So a very important thing that needs to occur is professional development. Emergency managers should do all they can to be educated and to be trained in emergency management so they'll better understand their profession and their uh, their duties and responsibilities. One of the things that they can do is become a certified emergency manager or an associate emergency manager. And this is a designation that can be acquired through the International Association of Emergency Managers. The goal is to basically explain what you've done to be more capable as an emergency manager and identify where you can uh, progress in different areas for the future. Well, just as we have a personal professional certification, we also have a community-wide certification. And this is a certification that really deals with our emergency management program in particular. Um, EMAP, the Emergency Management Accreditation Program, is run by the National Emergency Management Association. And uh, this program helps to assess you and evaluate your emergency management program. So as you do anything to get your community ready for a disaster, you want to keep these guidelines in mind from the Emergency Management Accreditation Program. Well, another thing we need to do is to understand the legal foundation of emergency management. In the United States, our emergency management system is based on the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. In addition, the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 44, also helps us to understand the obligations that we have in terms of carrying out our activities in emergency management. Furthermore, someone can learn about the legal foundation of emergency management from states. Each state will have its own unique law pertaining to emergency management. And of course, local and county governments will have ordinances and codes as well, which basically prescribe what an emergency manager do should do and uh, prohibit things that they cannot do in terms of their, their position and their professional responsibilities. So knowing the legal foundation really determines everything else that we should do. So as an emergency manager, you really need to read over and study and know these national, state, and local laws. Well, the next step is to have a planning council or create a local emergency planning committee. Basically, this is a group of individuals uh, 
that are brought together to ad provide advice to the emergency manager and the emergency management program. So this may include people from the government, uh, local government, different departments and agencies. It may include people from businesses. Perhaps there's a chemical facility in your jurisdiction. You might want to invite someone to be on your committee to help you understand the hazards that are posed from that facility and what can be done to uh, mitigate and prepare. In addition, you might have others from the Red Cross or nonprofit organizations, faith-based organizations. The point is to put a group together that can provide counsel and suggestions and recommendations for your emergency management program. Now, one very important planning council is a local emergency planning committee, and those are specifically geared towards chemical type of disasters, and they're required by law. Uh, but whether they're called LEPCs or planning councils, the goal is to have a group, again, to provide advice to you. Now, another very important measure is to acquire resources for your emergency management program. I love this cartoon, uh, this Dilbert cartoon, which really explains the, the importance of budgets. Uh, we can't do a lot to be prepared unless we have money to help us get uh, to accomplish the goals that we have. So that brings up budgeting. So in your jurisdiction, uh, there, will, there will be a call for budgets each year. And as an emergency manager, you would have to develop your budget. You would then go to a budget hearing and make your case, present your budget, and explain why you need the resources you're requesting. Eventually, a decision will be made, and hopefully you'll be awarded a budget. Uh, then you'll have to monitor and manage that throughout the year, spend money according to your goals and expectations, and then if needed at the end of the year, you may have to reconcile your budget to make sure that everything was spent correctly and that you didn't go over your budget. Now, another very important step is to acquire grants. Um, emergency management can be very expensive, but costs can be offset with external grants, grants from states or from the federal government. And so seeking and managing grants is an extremely important responsibility for emergency managers and has become even more important since 9-11. So I really like this quote from the Nuclear Energy Grant Application Handbook. It says that grant programs come in all sizes and shapes. They have a wide range of options, and each grant program is different, and it has its own rules and requirements. And even the same grant can change from year to year. So be aware that there's some complexity in um, acquiring and applying for and receiving and managing grants. Well, there's several different types of grants that can be acquired. Uh, some of them provide equipment for firefighters. Some of, us, some of them help us to be prepared for chemical emergencies. Others, like the Emergency Management Performance Grant, is really to subsidize the salary of emergency managers and local government. There's other grants for EOCs, Emergency Operations Centers, and other grants for mitigation or after disaster, there's public assistance grants. So as an emergency manager, you need to be aware of those possibilities and those opportunities to acquire resources for your community. Well, where can you acquire information about grants? Um, there's several websites that the federal government has provided. Those are listed here. You can also look at um, emergency management organization websites like FEMA or state emergency management agencies. Oftentimes they will list grants or have a grant coordinator that you can talk to and get more information uh, from. There's also regional or, or local emergency management um, organizations or your peers that you work with. You can ask them about emergency management grants and where they're located and how you can apply and how those grants work. The International Association of Emergency Managers may also put out information in newsletters or on their website about grants periodically. So if you're aware of grants, the, one of the things you need to do is to acquire the application and you want to read over it very carefully and understand the rules and requirements. Again, each grant is different and there's different expectations that uh, each grant has. So you want to follow the instructions, fill out things 
the form completely. Many of them will be online now. Um, make sure that you're providing details about what you're doing, how you're going to use your money. Be clear in your writing. Make sure that it's uh, correct in terms of grammar and spelling. Um, you may also want to get others to work with you to complete the application. So this could be your preparedness council, for example. They could help you put together your grant. Or maybe you were working with the police department or the fire department or some other entity in your jurisdiction. So at that point, uh, you can submit the application. And then hopefully you get the award. And if that happens, you need to formally accept the award. So there could be some signatures or setting up of um, accounts uh, and indexes uh, for your grant. Uh, you need to complete the purchases as outlined in the grant and, and fulfill the tasks and responsibilities as you promised in the application. Uh, periodically, you may need to send in reports to describe what you're doing each quarter, for instance, or every year. Uh, you're going to monitor the expenses, make sure there's no fraud, waste, or abuse, and then eventually, once you're done with everything, you're going to close out the grant and uh, provide a final report to the grant um, donor. Well, another very important uh, measure is to establish resource lists. So this could include um, personnel that could assist you in emergency management, key leaders, for example, the different departments uh, and their leaders and heads uh, of agencies and organizations. This would include all levels of government, uh, neighboring jurisdictions who are involved in mutual aid, and also others from the private and nonprofit sectors and faith-based faith groups. Uh, you might also need a list of equipment that you have or that you need and supplies and where you can get them. Uh, having a list of vendors and contractors, including their contact information, um, their addresses, their phone, their emails, um, all of those like, type of things. And maybe even having some contracts uh, on hand would be helpful for you to be, be prepared. There's a whole bunch of other things that you could include in a resource list, but I've, I've covered the main ones. And the point is to develop those and then update them periodically to make sure that you have correct information. Well, in conclusion, uh, there's a lot to know and do in order to be prepared for a disaster. And again, we haven't covered a lot of things like planning, training, or exercises. We'll do that later. Some of these activities include personal professional development, like CEM. Others relate to broader community efforts, like establishing a planning or preparedness council. We do need to understand the legal foundation, and uh, we do need to acquire resources as well. If you'd like additional information, I would refer you to a couple of publication publications, and there's many others out there that are great and I would strongly recommend. Anyway, good luck and best of wishes as you prepare your community.